Hi, welcome. This is a session we're doing on building and strengthening your network as a volunteer leader. My name is Eric Horwitz. I'm from uh, Columbia College, class of 90. I'm the uh, head coach of the Columbia Career Coaching Network. And I want to introduce my fellow panelists. Uh, what, is it not working? Is that better? OK, there we go. Now I got to do it like this. OK, thank you. Um, so that's too loud. OK, so we have Sasha McDowell and Chris Ishibashi. And um, I'd like each of you to tell us who you are, where you're from, and a fun and interesting fact about you. So Sasha, you go first. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah, all right. So my name's Sasha McDowell. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, a fun and interesting fact about me is I've been to five continents. And I know that I can get to the sixth. And uh, at a boring day at work many years ago, it prompted me to research what would it take to get to Antarctica um, so that I could say on my bucket list that I'd been to all seven. But apparently, the ice can get so thick that you get stuck there for four months. So it's not on my bucket list. I'd like to get to six. OK, thank you. My name is Chris Ishibashi. And I live in New York City. And I've pretty much lived here all my life. And um, I'm an introvert. But last year, I found that I really love improv. I spent a whole week, like 20 hours, I mean, five hours a day, six hours a day doing improv. And I had such a good time. Who knew? OK, and my fun, interesting fact is when I was at Columbia, I ran the Hartley Kosher Deli. And my genius move was when people wouldn't come and order the sandwiches, I put them all in a cart, I went over to Barnard, and I knocked on every door to sell the sandwiches. And that worked. So if your customer doesn't come to you, come to your customer. Good for you. All right. Um, who's first? I am. Chris is first. So good morning. The three of us are so glad that so many of you are interested in being better ne networkers. So as, can you all hear me? So as alumni leaders, we all network because we want to engage new members for our groups. We want to persuade active members to become more active. In other words, take on leadership roles and to find partners to engage with and to put great events together with. But as one alumni leader once told me, um, it's tough to get volunteers. Columbia alums are busy people. So as an alum leader, you're competing against people's work, their professional associations, their family, and community groups for their attention. And this alumni leader complained to me that, you know, alumni activities are sometimes pretty low on their list of people's list of priorities, like after their children and jobs. And so it's really hard. So as leaders who are looking to get their attention and their help, you really need to engage them personally. So before a networking event, um, most of us know what we have to do. We get our intro ready. We, in other words, we're ready to talk about who we are. We're fluent. We become fluent. We get all the words and music down about the nature and the mission and what our groups do. And of course, we know the ask, what we're asking the person we're networking with, what we want from them. But let's take a step back from that um, and think about someone who made us feel connected to them when we met them. I bet that the, so I'd like for each of you to think about someone who you met recently or maybe not so recently that you remember, you remember that meeting and you can remember that they really made you feel good and you felt happy talking to them. I bet the person that you're thinking of made you feel like you were important. 
and that they cared about you, that they listened to you and they felt what you were saying. I hear that one of former President Bill Clinton's many gifts was making people feel that went for the moment that he was speaking to them, that they were the most important person in the whole world. So people that we're attracted to make us feel heard and that they've listened to what we've said and they've understood it. So how do we go about doing that? Well, it starts with your attention. You need to focus on them. Um, you can't be distracted looking around the room, seeing who's there. You can't be distracted, allow your cell phone to distract you. Remember, your focus on networking needs to be on them. The other thing is, is that when we're talking to people, when you're talking to someone, are you really listening to what they're saying? Or are you in your head thinking about, uh-oh, what am I gonna say next? And people can tell if you're listening to them or if you're thinking about something else. Next is our body language. Are we facing them or are we looking at them like this? Um, are our arms crossed? Are we leaning away from them? Um, are we looking all over the place? These are things that might make them think that we're not interested in them if we're, if we're if we have closed body language. Another thing that is helpful is asking open-ended questions. You want to encourage your conversation partner to talk so you can learn more about them. Open-ended questions encourage your conversation partner um, because they cannot be answered with a yes or a no. Open-ended questions typically start with the words what, why, or how? How did you do that? What makes you feel that way about her? That sort of thing. And finally, you want to acknowledge what they've said. They've given you a gift in sharing information about themselves with you. And so it's appropriate to thank them for that gift because they've shared some of themselves with you. So we're now going to do an exercise, okay? In a couple minutes, I'm going to ask you to find a partner, hopefully someone you don't know that well, but time is tight, so don't go too crazy about that. You don't know them, um, Bart. And I want you to start talking. You can talk about anything you like, but the rule is that every time your partner finishes talking, before you say what you were going to say, you have to thank, you have to say thank you to your partner before you start talking. And that's true with the first time you talk to this person, and it's true with the fifth time you talk to this person. So whatever your back and forth is, that's fine. So I will stop your conversation in a couple of minutes to change the rules. So please find a partner, Introduce yourself and start talking, but remember, you have to say thank you. Okay. okay, you can stop. Can you stop for just a second? I'm going to change the rules on you. You don't have to say thank you as you resume your conversations by saying the words thank you, but you need to say thank you with a gesture, a nod, a smile, a wink, I don't know, whatever you like that's nonverbal, but you must convey the spirit of thank you as you continue your conversation for just another minute. Go ahead. Thank you all. How did, so I feel a lot of energy in this room. You, you all were 
talking up a storm here. So how did it feel to say thank you as you were talking? Anybody? Thank you for teaching us to say thank you. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. But how did it make you feel when someone said thank you to you? Anybody? Did it feel good? Was it really annoying? Great. And how did that make you feel? More engaged. Okay. Good. So, um, I think the value of saying thank you, as um, this woman said, is Marty said, is it makes you feel more engaged when someone acknowledges what you're saying. So, aside from acknowledging the other person, there are ways that we make other people feel a little disrespected. Um, one thing that sometimes we do is we disrespect people's business cards. You know, when someone gives you a business card, they're sharing a part of themselves with you. So you don't want to just take it, throw it in your pocket. You should take it as if it's valuable and handle it like a valuable gift. Hold it up, look at it, thank them before you put it away. They've given you, but acknowledge that you've given them something valuable. The other thing that's important in terms of networking and making sure that your networking is successful, that you make a connection with somebody, is that you've got to follow up. As anyone in sales will tell you, no matter how charming you are, most people don't go to some kind of event, meet someone, sweep them off their feet, and sell and make a sale. Sales usually take many interactions to consummate. So likewise, if you're asking, you're looking for someone to become more engaged with your organization, to give the gift of their time, it's probably going to take more than one interaction. Don't think you're going to go to that one event, meet them, sweep them off their feet, and they're going to do everything you ask. Follow up will really help with that. And the final thing that we sometimes do that make our networking, the people we're talking to, not feel valued is we talk too much about ourselves. Um, I remember reading one of the first books about networking I read about Dale, Car Dale Carnegie talked about how I is the most popular word in the English language. So um, what I would like for all of you to do now in our final exercise is to talk amongst the people at your tables about the benefits of being an alumni leader. The only caveat is that you cannot use the word I. And what I would like for all of you to do for the few minutes that you're doing this is to, I challenge you not to use the word I. And the people at your table are going to keep you honest because if you say the word I, they're going to make some obnoxious noise like ah. <laughs> so um, challenge yourselves to talk about that topic without using the word I. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, how did that go? Not so easy to not say I, is it? And I hear that some of you had some fun trying this out. But anyway, I just, th that basically wraps up my presentation. I just wanted to say Thank you all for your participation this morning. And if you remember nothing else about networking, remember that networking is all about them. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone.
everybody. Hello. Good morning. So my name is Sasha McDowell. And I'm going to talk a little bit about reframing your thinking um, when you're networking in situations that you're not necessarily feeling you're most comfortable in. So when I'm working with coaching clients, I find that many of them don't like networking. I hear different reasons, including not liking small talk, um, worrying that they won't have enough to say in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But I often hear people say networking feels false or salesy or just like it's a series of inauthentic conversations. So I think the key to improving ability and confidence when it comes to networking is really redefining what it means to you, um, focusing on ways that it genuinely benefits your life, um, and then really identify the best ways for you to network based on your personality and your preferences. I think that for some people this really requires spending some time changing your thinking, but I think once you've changed your mindset out of that, you can really develop some strategies and a plan for how you're gonna network in situations where you're not as comfortable. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at some common reasons that people are not as comfortable networking, thinking about how we can reframe some of those negative thoughts, and then what are some concrete strategies you can use when you're in those situations to thrive. Um, so the first one is, get my slides here. Networking means asking for something from somebody that I don't know, and I'm not comfortable with something that's just a transaction. And I think the reframe here is that networking is really about building a relationship over time. You don't have to do it all at once in that first interaction. And when you think about building a relationship, one of the best ways to build a relationship with people is just really focusing on them, getting to know them, and thinking about ways that you can give. Um, so I think some strategies here is just showing up with really showing your genuine curiosity in other people. What do they do professionally? What do they like about their jobs? What do they dislike the most about their field? What do they love to do outside of work? Um, also identifying ways to be helpful. This for many people is really comforting because it's an opportunity to give. So after taking some time to learn about them, you can just ask them directly, I'd love to be helpful to you. Is there an introduction can I make? Is there something that you're looking to do next and I could help be a resource? Finding ways to stay connected. Um, again, you're developing a relationship and it happens over time. So you can stay in touch. You all know this. There's a variety of ways to do this. Sharing articles or, or podcasts, offering to make an introduction, connecting on LinkedIn, or having coffee one-on-one -on -one and then continuing to follow up every few months. And then I think for me, I like to think about this as an opportunity to be generous. And that's really one of the keys to building relationships that last. And then over time, as you build your comfort level with this person, you can also make your ask. In some situations, you're going to do that right away. But for folks where that's not as comfortable, you can do that after you've had a few interactions with this person. The second reason that I often hear is I don't like small talk or superficial conversations. So I think a different way to think about this is that the task is really to be yourself and to spark a conversation that is authentic and meaningful. Networking actually means expanding the circle of people that you know and like, and it's an opportunity to share what you know and to gain new information from other people. Um, I was reading recently about a CEO who, when he's interviewing people, he always asks himself, would I want to go on vacation with this person? And if the answer is no, he doesn't hire them. <laughs> and so what I like about that, we might not always be in that situation ourselves, but what I like about that is you can give yourself that permission to really be yourself and to spend your time creating relationships with people who you do enjoy talking to and learning from. So a few strategies here. Again, you want to connect around things you have in, have in common professionally. In advance, you can identify two to three topics that you want to bring up that have some depth. Um, you can, of course, choose something, choose a topic related to your field that's going to help you and this other person connect. So if you're in sales, you're at a conference, you've read something interesting, you can say to somebody, I read this new idea, it's a little bit out of the box, I think it's interesting, what do you think? Um, and the key is really that you want to steer the conversation towards learning how the other person thinks and get them to share their knowledge. And this is going to help the conversation move out of a surface level place. Um, and then I think that when you're not comfortable, planning in advance is really key so that you're not trying to think on your feet when you're not feeling your best. And then finally, again, you're trying to make a genuine connection. Um, you want to approach people with genuine curiosity and choose topics that are interesting to you in order to do that. 
Um, you can talk about work, you can talk about outside interests, and then the conversations that you have that do feel a little bit organic, that feel interesting and engaging, that can help you identify the people that you do want to follow up with. And I just wanted to take a moment to say also that I think that as leaders in the workplace, we've all faced politics, we have faced difficult company cultures, we have had bosses with very different styles, and I think that in the journey to be successful, we do often feel pressure to act a certain way rather than to be who we are. Um, and I think that those are real pressures that emerge from real workplace dynamics, so I don't think there's necessarily an easy fix. Um, but I wanted to share a quote that I like because I think that many of us need to hear this reminder over and over again, which is really just no matter the conversation or the company, being your sincere and complete self is the most important part of networking. It's a waste of energy to act like everybody else, to act like anybody else, excuse me. The third common reason I hear is I don't like talking about myself. So sort of as Chris shared, I think the reframe here is you really want to find ways to get the other person talking and then prepare in advance for those times that you are going to be talking about yourself. So if you're somebody and you don't feel that comfortable um, striking up conversations with other people, you can prepare some easy conversation openers so that when you're in that moment, you know what to say. They're not complicated. You know these already simple openers like, why did you come to this event? Where do you work? What do you do there? Um, often opening that conversation is just always the most difficult part. And then once you get that person talking, you can move into a more genuine and interesting conversation and that just gets easier. Um, another thing that many of my coaching clients like to do is to prepare a list of questions in advance so that they really feel ready to have a conversation with people that they're curious about. Um, again, these are things that you would ask genuinely, so just the preparation will help them roll off your tongue. Um, when you're talking about yourself, again, as Chris mentioned, you really want to have that elevator pitch ready to go, something brief so people have a sense of who you are and you know, why they're talking to you. Again, you want to practice this in advance so that you're ready to go. Um, and then if you are going to ask, make an ask, I think many people, if they haven't prepared in advance, they can make a very general ask. And as you guys all know, people are busy. So you open up that email, you get a general ask, and if in 10 seconds you can't really place somebody, you don't do anything, and they go into the bucket of unread emails, right? So the more specific you can be in that ask, the easier it is for people to sort of know where to point you, right? So I'm looking for an operations role in the environmental or sustainability field, or I'm really looking to meet managers in the environmental field. It just helps people quickly assign you. Um, and I think that also can help with the comfort level in following up. Sometimes people can get shy about following up if they don't hear back from somebody, and a more specific ask um, is a better guarantee that you will hear people, hear back from people. Another thing that I often hear from people is this person is very senior to me. What would I have to say to them? And I think the reframe here is you can highlight your character rather than your achievements. Um, if you're talking to somebody older, you don't have to come across as an expert. Your experience level is enough for where you are, just as their experience level is enough for where they are. Um, this is also an opportunity to really listen to somebody else and to ask thoughtful questions, and you can use it as an opportunity to learn from this other person. And then again, you want to follow up. You can do the things I mentioned before, articles, LinkedIn, but you can also send them a personal email and reference your conversation and show them that you were really listening to what they had to say and that you enjoyed the conversation and you'd like to keep in touch with them. And then a final reason that I often hear is networking means going to events that I hate <laughs> and it makes me feel stressed. Um, and so I think, again, the reframe here is giving yourself permission to do the bulk of your networking in situations where you actually feel comfortable. So I think that's really thinking about your personal style. What do you enjoy? Where do you come alive and really enjoy sharing and listening with others? Is it big conferences? Is it panels? Is it one-on-one -on -one coffees? You can do the things you genuinely enjoy in environments where you are comfortable. And then when you have to do the things that you dislike, just limit how often that you do them. Um, spend some time in advance working on your thoughts when you have to go into those situations and identify ways to make yourself feel more comfortable. And then I think people feel permission to reach out to other people through different things. Some people feel like they need to be up on a panel giving a talk and then they can approach anybody. Other people feel like if they've given in the past, they can make an ask in the future. Or if I've spent a lot of time listening, then I've sort of earned the right to talk. So I think 
Reflect on what makes you comfortable reaching out to others. When you put that into action, again, it'll get easier over time. So we're gonna do an activity. Um, you're gonna talk again to some folks at your table, hopefully somebody new, if you can navigate that logistically. And we're gonna do a few things. Um, you've already introduced yourselves. You're going to spend a minute writing down some situations where you feel comfortable networking. Then you're also going to write down some situations where you feel uncomfortable networking and try to identify why. That's going to help you think about what are the underlying thoughts when you're comfortable or uncomfortable. Then after a couple minutes, you're going to share your list with your partner. You're going to talk about why the discomfort. How can you reframe your thinking and change your mindset about that situation? And then what are some concrete strategies you can put into place in the future? And then at the end, I'll sort of let you know one more minute. And I'd like you to actually write down three actionable takeaways. Taking a moment to pause and write things down can really help things stick in our brains that will not stay in our brains in our otherwise busy days. So three things, writing down comfort and uncomfort, sharing your list with your partner, talking really about why, reframing, and strategies. And then you're going to write down your takeaways, all right? And I'll give you minutes to change into the different parts, all right? So go ahead. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Lots of good conversations I hear, because you can't even hear me and I'm mic'd. <laughs> So we're going to wrap up our conversations and take a minute to write down your three actionable takeaways before we leave this morning. So take a minute to write a couple things down and then we'll wrap up. All right. So I think networking becomes unpleasant when we let somebody else define what it is for us. Um, I recently read about a Harvard researcher who studies workplace awkwardness, and she found that when most people hear the word networking, they actually feel disgust. And the activity becomes significantly more palatable when people are less focused on themselves and more focused on the other person. Um, and she also showed that people were much more successful at culting, cultivating relationships when they stopped thinking about what they thought other people wanted from them and focused more on being themselves. And interestingly enough, she found that we're actually not that good at being able to tell what other people want from us. And when we're in that mode, people perceive us as less authentic. So you're better off just being yourself. Um, so again, it's really just about reframing how you think about networking, focusing on building real relationships, being genuinely curious about other people, and being who you are. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody, this is good news. I want you to pull out your phones. Don't put your phones away. You can put your phones on the table, okay? So uh, what we're going to talk about is how to become a, a leader uh, digitally, okay? So this is a very engaging conversation and topic that gets people very upset and very polarized when we talk about how you look, appear, and what you do to network digitally, okay? So feel free to get upset about this. Okay. So... I'm just going to use this. OK, so here's some truisms. There's nothing new under the sun. So essentially, everything that you deal, deal with digitally and you think is so new, when there was a little village and there was only 100 people in the village and then they made a newspaper, everybody's business was known. OK? Number two, what you do digitally affects your reputation. And it's not the end of the world if something shows up for you online, but it, it is, it feeds into your life. So there's, I gave you a little Shakespeare. And then a little Mark Zuckerberg, which is 
You're better off trying something and having it not work than not trying something at all. So something that's a challenge for people that are educated is you imagine that everything that you're gonna put online is gonna be there forever and it's never gonna change. And guess what? There is so much data being put on the internet that whatever you're doing is not the end of the world. If you misspell something or if you make a mistake, you can delete it, you can fix it. So as you see, I've given you like two opposite concepts all happening simultaneously. Okay. So now let's talk about you and thinking about becoming a digital leader for your organization. So the number one first thing you need to do is really think about what are the top priorities for the organization that you're leading. Is it networking? networking? Is it advocacy? Are you teaching people things? Are you giving back? And so you want to write that down for yourself. Okay, I'm running this organization like I run the Columbia Coaching Network. What we want to be able to give back to the Columbia community to help them with their careers. So that's one of our priorities. Then you want to really sit down and think about what are your personal priorities? So are you promoting your own business? Are you looking to meet new people? Are you looking to reflect to others that you are a leader worth listening to? Okay, so you want to juxtapose, juxtapose those two um, ideas. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little exercise, which is the first thing you now wanna do is you wanna see what your digital footprint looks like. So if you pull out your phones, you can go on to the Columbia Wireless Network. So it says Columbia University. And I want you to Google yourself, okay? Which a lot of people don't do, okay? So everybody go ahead, type in your name and see what you see. Okay, so some of the things you're gonna discover is there's someone else exactly with your name who is more Google Google than you are, okay? So what you wanna do is kinda look through the first three pages. And why I'm having you do this is because every person who hears about you or gets to know you or is going to interview you will Google you first. So it doesn't matter what you tell them, they're already gonna have an impression. But they're only gonna look at the first, about the first three screens. So for example, if you've been in, in some sort of legal action or you've had some sort of debate online or you have political contributions that you've made to a political party, all of that will be somewhere online, okay? But if it's on page four or page five, nobody's really gonna see that. So it's not like the scarlet letter, like you're not walking around with it forever. <laughs> okay, is everybody looking? Anybody found anything interesting? Go ahead, you, you, right. You found, what did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay, there you go. So, um, okay, so, the, so this is again, trying to understand what you look like to other, this is your, this is your digital suit, okay? So the other thing you might want to be able to do is you can log off of Facebook and you can search for yourself on Facebook and you can see what your privacy settings are. So you might think that you're being very um, private on Facebook, but that may not actually be the case. And then you want to go through some of the other uh, digital ways of finding yourself. Instagram, All right, I know everybody just like, let it go. I know it's fascinating to find yourselves. <laughs> uh, Instagram. LinkedIn, see what LinkedIn groups you are in, Snapchat, Twitter, okay. Okay, okay ready? So, um, everybody, can we get, can we focus, hello? Thank you, shh, shh, no. That got really exciting. I told you this is exciting stuff. <laughs> okay, so now, now that you kind of know what you look like, you also have to know the concept of how the digital world works, okay? So essentially, it's, an, it's a place to share information. So when you're reaching out to your network, you wanna know kind of what 
information you're getting globally in the world will be of interest, what might be local news of interest, what's going on in Colombia, so you can follow uh, any of the Colombia websites to get information, any news related to the organization that you're dealing with or similar organizations in this area. What's really critical in order to have validity digitally is to know what fake news is and be careful not to post it. And that is such a broad, strange comment to make because somebody's fake news is somebody else's real news. So you kind of want to look out for like, say if it says NBC News, there could be something called NBC News Daily, right? Which may not be NBC News at all, right? So just don't have the impulse to share something because you think it's provocative. Make sure to kind of see where it's coming from, okay? And also, obviously, something that it gets a lot of engagement digitally is anything associated with politics. That's the hot topic. So um, that's the kind of thing you want to be sharing. Then the other thing is, is rather than looking at specific news sites, there are news aggregators. Okay. So what you want to do is aggregate your news through your like your phone into a news aggregator, like Apple News has something, and make sure you're moving your news across the political spectrum. Because what happens to you is you can be completely in a, a thought bubble where the world works a certain way and you get your news. And when you, when you aggregate your news cycles, you can see the same piece of news being spread in completely different descriptions. Okay. Okay. So now that you, you have the sense of that is you want to create your profile if you have not created your profile. Okay. So. Start off from a professional level, you start off with your LinkedIn profile, then Facebook, then Instagram, then Snapchat, Tumblr, YouTube, and whatever else is coming out that's totally new that you haven't heard of, okay? And then in addition to that, it used to be that everyone got junk mail, right? So you didn't even look at your mail because you got junk mail. Now, when you get something in the mail, you're just so excited you have to read it, right? So. Now, something you get in the paper mail, you want to look at. It also used to be that we got tons of email. Now people don't email as much. So another way in which you can engage with your, with your audience or with the people you want to deal with is to, to use email again. But you want to use something like constant contact, which means that people can unsubscribe from it if you, if you send it to them. Okay? And when you're creating the profile in each of these things, what's your message? Now, you do not need to be on every single one of these sites. The point is, is you want to at least stake your claim in each one. So set up a profile, know how that works, and leave it at that. So as an example, Facebook is actually less active compared to Instagram. Of course, Facebook owns Instagram, so it's all still the same thing. But people have gravitated from Facebook to Instagram, which is just a different avenue to communicate. Many younger people were moving through to Snapchat, which had stories where, which disappeared. Well, then Instagram created the same thing that Snapchat had, and people moved back from Snapchat to Instagram. So the point, the reason why I tell you you need to get on all of them is because people are moving between them relatively quickly, and basically people will only go to the sites in which there's activity. So it's like a little swarm of bees just moving, moving along. So don't just pick one, because you could be posting stuff on one that nobody is actually looking at. Then you want to be very conscious about who you are digitally. There's you yourselves here in the room, and then's your, then there's your digital self. And the digital self doesn't have to do anything with the real self. It's like another self, okay? It is marketing and branding of you, however you want to appear and be, okay? So things you want to think about, like, for example, you have the opportunity to take a professional picture upstairs, right? Um, you want to think about what interests you want to reflect uh, through your information and how you cultivate your how you cultivate your views and interests. Because you are really communicating to people what you think, what you believe. And remember, when you meet them in person, they might have already Googled you, so you have to be uh, consistent. Or be prepared not to be consistent. Okay. Okay. So now let's say you're running an organization and you've built your profile and now you want to connect with volunteers in your group. So you really want to, and this, look, I'm making up these rules because this only 
thing was invented like 20 years ago. So this is really, let me, this is a really important point. The internet's only existed now for about 16 years. There really are no rules, okay? So we're gonna make up some rules and we're gonna behave this way and culture and society is gonna figure out how this should work, okay? So what I would recommend is you start off with connecting with your volunteers through LinkedIn. It's the most professional, not, per, you know, not personal. When that maybe you've developed a relationship with people, you can move on to connecting with them through a Facebook group rather than Facebook individually. Then you can follow them on Instagram, which is a little less intrusive, and follow them on YouTube. And then if you've really built a relationship with somebody, it's appropriate to ask them to be their friend on Facebook. They may or not friend you. If they don't friend you, do not take it personally. They may want to have certain levels of privacy. Like I, I Facebook friended Abby, and she, I'm still waiting. It's not happening. I don't, I don't know. I, I taking it personally, so I figured I'd bring it up in front of 100 people. So now it's on her. Um, and then maybe Snapchat or Pinterest, uh, just depending on who you are or where you're from. Okay? All right. So now here's some concepts around sharing content. Make sure the content is rel relevant to your audience. Secondly, engageable. It's a word I made up, and I'm allowed to make up words. Um, engageable means like you post something in which people could comment on it. And when they comment on it, comment back. Because it's as if you were at them in person and they said something to you and you just walked away. Right? You can't do that. Re post regularly, not too regularly. I always will post on a certain, certain medium, I will post once a day in the morning, okay? Not more than once a day. On others, maybe once a week. Always curate what you've written. So for example, as an example, our president was wanted a certain candidate to win and then he didn't win, so he deleted all the Twitter where he said that he wanted him to win. Okay, that's what means to curate your social media, which is look back at it and say like, oh, I said this a couple months ago, but did I mean it? Did I really wanna say it? How does it look now, okay? And then you can also monitor your activity to see how, how good you are at marketing your, your activities or your, or your leadership. So Bitly is a website you can use when you post an, post an, uh, an article to see how many people looked at it. When you post on Instagram stories, it'll show you every single person who's looked at your Instagram. Um, on Snapchat, you can also do the same, so you can know who's, who's stalking you, which is always good to know. And then also, you can look at unfollows. There's apps you can look at to see, oh, I've been posting a lot of activity on Instagram, and people really don't like what I'm having to say, and they're unfollowing me, okay? Okay, so that's, that's when you start to share content. Okay, all right, so here's some of my do's. If you wanna be a digital leader, number one, post on a regular basis, like be active in it. Be engaged with your content, so make sure you read what's being posted, and if you're getting messages on Facebook and LinkedIn, you have to respond to them. It's like email. People remember that you, they sent you a LinkedIn message and you didn't look at your LinkedIn for two months, okay? And there's opportunities there. Be funny, don't be so serious, that's boring. Be real, like, you know, if you Photoshop every picture and then I meet you in person, you don't look anything like your picture. <laughs> you know, it's like me with a haircut, it's not good. Okay, always be aware of new tools. Don't get resistant to new technologies, it's just a bad habit. Everyone freaks out when Facebook makes a new, a new version of Facebook and they get all upset. I'm like, it wasn't here 10 years ago, calm down. Okay. Use video, video is being much more used. Use hashtags, so what, when you, let's say, if I say hashtag Col Columbia Alumni Weekend, other people can find you that way, so you can gain new audiences by using hashtags. Be positive, so the media and the news is so negative, everything is like nuclear war, it's the end of times, it's really depressing, and you don't wanna hear that all the time, so make sure that you're not sharing more negativity, and this is just sort of like karma philosophical stuff, okay? And be aware of peak posting times. So for example, Mondays are not always so good, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, during the middle of the week, when people get bored with their five-day work week, they just start looking at the internet, okay? 
And there are also tools like on Instagram where you can, you can find out um, what the times are. Okay. Don't assume you know someone's politics, okay? Just because somebody went to a liberal college does not mean they're a liberal. And just because somebody lives in Alabama doesn't mean they're conservative, okay? Don't tag people without their permission, especially your children, because then they get really pissed at you and they, it's not good <laughs> from personal experience. Um, as I said, don't share fake news. Don't post too many baby pictures. I mean, basically, I want to see my baby. I'm not sure I want to see your baby. Okay. Don't post more than once a day. Don't waste money on Facebook ads, except use, use ads when appropriate. They're really inexpensive in a way, and you can reach large audiences. So, so try it, but be aware of how it impacts impacts what you're doing. And you can really target who you're speaking to. So you could say, I want to heighten this article to people at Columbia who were born in New York but live in LA. And it will target right to those individuals. Okay. And like I said before, don't think that people don't look at you digitally before they meet you. Every job interview, everyone in HR, everyone in this room is looking at people in advance. Okay. And, they, and here's what they do after they look at you. They go on Facebook and they see who you know that they know. And if they don't like that person, they may not like you. Is that rational? No, but it doesn't matter. That's, that's the benefit and the problem with it. Okay. And then the other thing is, what I said before is, don't assume you know people because you look at their social media. Because as I said, you can make up whatever you want on that. So it's just their branding about who they are. Because these are my digital life lessons. Like, it hasn't been around long, but I got life lessons. Okay. Your Facebook, your digital life, it's an identity. It's going to live with you forever, and after you die, it's still going to be living. Okay? So it's going to keep going longer than you. I have, and you can, make real personal and professional relationships that you met people digitally. It doesn't matter whether you first met them in person or if you meet them online. Don't overuse it, it's gonna make you crazy. So it's like really have some self-control, like maybe an hour a day in the morning or 30 minutes, but like not all the time. Because it works with your dopamine and like every time you get a like, it makes you happier, it's like a drug. Okay, um, don't overestimate its value. It's really, it's like, it's not gonna, there's a couple of people in this world that have made like a career out of it, but most people, it, it, it's not gonna do that. Um, this one's a big one for all my Columbia folks. Spelling is overrated, okay? The English language is moving to emojis, okay? So don't get upset with other people if they misspell things. You can edit something if you misspell it. It's not that important anymore. I'm sorry, okay? That's the way of the world, okay? Privacy is relative and somewhat been destroyed. So none of us have the same privacy that we had 20 years ago. Everybody in this room can take a picture of anybody in this room, post it on their social media, and if you told people you weren't here because you lied and they see it on social media, they know you're here, okay? So just because you didn't post it doesn't mean someone else did it, okay? And the other thing is, is when you're engaging with people, you can't focus on people in reality, right? So a lot of people are doing Instagram stories all the time, so they're not actually with people. So it's important if you're engaging with people, like my compadre said, you, um, you want to put that thing down, okay? All right, so we have a really quick exercise, which is just go ahead, go on LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn. Some two people you met today, see if you can find them on LinkedIn, connect with them. And then also with me and Chris and Sasha, if you can find us on LinkedIn, go ahead, find us and send a request and say hello. So try that for a couple minute or two. Oh, yes, I will do that, if I can do that. Okay, well, I can do it. There we go. Okay, there we are. Find us. Look for us. Are we good? <laughs> okay, um, you guys can keep doing this. Hopefully, you've, you've found some people that you're connecting with. It seems like, so you guys, you guys already knew each other. So you, you knew you knew in person. It's okay. It's all right. 
Okay. So hopefully you guys got a little familiar with how you can create and sustain your, your digital self and also how you can network with people both in person and digitally. Okay, um, thank you very much for your time.